it is. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, I'll just keep walking if I fall off the front of the stage. Maybe somebody will notice. But I want to welcome you here to the lake. And if you are here with us for the first time, if you're a guest with us for the first time, we're in this series uh, that we're calling What Would Jesus Undo? Not what would Jesus do? People, people are familiar with that. We all, we, maybe we grew up in that generation. We, we are familiar with the WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? All the bracelets and the T-shirts and the stuff like that. But our series is... What would Jesus undo? What are the things when we look at his life? What are the things that bothered him? What are the things that dissatisfied him? And what are the things that broke his heart? And last week, we started this series by looking at spiritual indifference. This spiritual indifference is, is in the life of a believer that they really, they really aren't living their life or living out their life, doing and living what they say they believe. And the revelation is called to the church of Laodicea. It was called being lukewarm. You're not hot. You're not cold. You really don't care that much about other people. You really don't care that much about the gospel, sharing the gospel. You're just kind of lukewarm, just going through life. And if, if, we could do, if we could just do one thing, if we could, you know, there's several things that cause this. There's this illusion. There's this illusion of uh, self-sufficiency that I have all that I need. I got all that I want. I don't need anything else. I don't need any help from anybody. I can do this on my own. And then there's the distractions of the world. We get tied up in the world and all busy, connected to the world, and disconnected from God. We become lukewarm. We become spiritually indifferent. But we learned last week that if we could do just one thing, Every day, just one thing. If we could just do one thing by faith every day, something that we cannot do on our own, but to trust God to do this, then Jesus would undo our spiritual indifference and replace it with a spiritual fire, a passion to live our life for God, to do all we can for God. And I just wondered if anybody did that this past week. I tried a couple times, and it's really hard. You know, it's really hard to trust God with this. And I, maybe, maybe it's because we started this series. It just seemed like every day I had something come up. It's like, I just, I can't handle this. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with this. God, if you would just, I'm going to leave it up to you, God. This, this, this be all yours today. Call me when it's over, you know, because this, I can't, I don't want to deal with this right now. I'm going to trust him with it. And I got thinking this week about this spiritual indifference and the effects of spiritual difference in someone's life. And I think it, it produces like a, an emptiness inside of us. That on the outside, we look like everything's okay. On the outside, we look like other believers. But on the inside, something is missing. We may be acting the part and going through the motions, but there's a void inside. There's an emptiness inside. It's kind of like, uh, you ever done that little Christmas game? Uh, where everybody brings all these wrapped presents, and you just sort of have to go up there and pick one, and if that's the one, and then there's all kinds of hate that happens after that, but the, <laughs> all the, the stealing and the robbery and the backstabbing and stuff. But, you know, you go up there, and you get when you're excited. It's your turn. It's your number. And you go up there, and you pull out the package, and it's all wrapped, all pretty and stuff, and you tear it apart because it, it looks like a great package, but it's empty inside. I mean, there's nothing in it. It looks like everybody else's package, but this thing is empty. And could it be that this emptiness that happens like that, it surprises us? Could that, come, could that happen in one of our Sunday morning gatherings that we're sitting in church? And is it, could, it, could the, the music be empty or could the message be empty? I mean, just think about it. The, the songs that we just sang. Could there be an emptiness there? In the message that I'm delivering today, could there be an emptiness there? Is the, and when we serve, when we're serving in back here in Lake Kids, we serve during the week with Lake students, and you serve out front with the guest services. It, are we offering to God anything other than an emptiness? That we're not really sure why we're doing this. We're not really sure. We don't have any heart or anything into it. Does it affect all that? What if, what if our lives are so wrapped up Get that wrapped up with this spiritual image to where we look like everybody else, but we're actually offering God empty. Uh, what I call today a hollow worship. And if, and, if, and if we're offering a hollow worship, what would Jesus undo about this hollow worship in our life? 
So what I want to do, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be looking in the first book of the Gospels, Matthew. I'm going to look in Matthew, give you a chance to get there. Uh, Jesus is having a conversation with some Pharisees and some teachers of the law. And it's in Matthew chapter 15. And it's going to be the very first verse. We're going to start with the very first verse in Matthew chapter 15. And it says this. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from from Jerusalem and asked, Why why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And I'm like, wow, what a crazy question. And it wasn't so much, they, it, they weren't so much complaining about that they didn't wash their hands, but they didn't wash their hands in a particular manner. There was a specific manner that they needed to wash their hands, and that was in the tradition of the elders, the way it's always been done. This is what we follow. This is how it's been done. The, and it had nothing to do with whether the guys showered that day, whether they shaved that day, whether they had enough deodorant on, or they used body wash. None of that. It, it, it all come it all come down to the tradition of the elders because the Pharisees were so obsessed they were so obsessed with laws and regulations and rules and traditions and one of those traditions was being ceremonially clean ceremonial cleanliness you had to have this specific type of cleanliness so to a devout Jew life is broken up into two parts everything in life is in two parts Parts. It's either clean or unclean. You were either clean or unclean. There were clean animals and there were unclean animals. There were clean ways to prepare food and there were unclean ways to prepare food. You could touch clean things, but you couldn't touch unclean things. If you touched a pig, you were unclean. If, if you touched a dead body, you were unclean. If you had a rash on your skin, if you had a breakout on your skin, a dryness on your skin, you were considered unclean. And when they considered you unclean, you were contagious. Your uncleanliness was transferable. Kind of like cooties in the third grade. Ew, goodies, goodies. You know how that went? People just avoided you. You were contagious. This is how they... And so if, if you're unclean, you had to go through a ceremony, an elaborate ceremony to get clean, not just physically, but spiritually, so that you would be eligible and allowed to worship God, to even walk into the temple. And this is, you know, I'm like... Are you serious? And it had to be done in a certain way. And when it came to washing your hands in the tradition of the elders, it, had, it, only, it took just a specific amount of water poured on your hands in a specific manner to get you clean. You could not, you could not stick your hands in a bucket of water and wash your hands because now the water is unclean because you're unclean, it's transferable. Now the bucket is unclean. You couldn't go to the sink and turn the faucet to wash your hands because now the faucet is unclean. And I'm reading this and studying this from the, the law and stuff. I'm like, are you kidding me? When, when I was a kid, and we'd play Little League or get with some guys together on a, some, play some sandlot ball, and somebody would show up with some, some snacks or something like that. All I had to do to be clean enough, with, and I was good to go. Right? That's all it took. It, 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 clean. You got to go through the, But to the Pharisees, you had to do a certain process. You had to take your hands like this. Looks like you're diving, doesn't it? Head, take your hands like this, and someone would pour a specific amount of water, just a couple ounces, on your hands. And once your hands got wet, you'd rub them, and now you're ceremonially clean. And they not only did this before they ate, because why don't they wash your hands before they ate? They not only did this before they ate, they did this between courses. So get this in your mind. Before you can eat your fries, Then, before you can eat your Whopper, <laughs> then, before you drink your shake, 
This is how they were doing it. This is this is what this is their this was their laws, and this is why why aren't you? They're like, why aren't your boys doing this? Jesus, why don't your boys do it this way? And then when you read in there, Jesus just goes off. He just unleashes on the Pharisees. What are you talking about? You, of all people, you disrespect people. You dishonor parents. You teach the children to dishonor their parents. You don't love people anymore. You bend the rules. You treat the law to your benefit. And here you are focused on somebody washing their hands on this external stuff. And on the inside, you're pathetic. And then he says this in verse 7. He says, you hypocrites. Love that. You, he's talking to the Pharisees. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah, and they would know that. As soon as he said Isaiah, they, this prophecy would have come. He was right when he prophesied about you. These people, these people mean these religious people who look religious, honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They give me lip service, but their hearts aren't right. And then he says this, they worship me in vain. They look like worship on the outside. But because the inside is not right, it's an empty gift that's hollow. It doesn't please God at all. And I look at my life and I have to ask myself, is he describing my worship? And if he is, what could he undo? What would Jesus undo in my life? Would he undo the show of worship, the act of worship, the pretend worship, the going through the motions, playing the church game? Because it may look like worship on the outside, but on the inside, heart may be far from God. And when we, when we talk about worship, when I stand up on stage and I talk about worship, most people's minds go directly to music. Well, I like this style of worship. Well, I like that style of worship. And some people maybe go to the environment of worship. That worship needs to be reverent. Worship needs to be a holy atmosphere. When somebody else says, no, 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 no. It needs to be rowdy. It needs to be fun. It needs to be excitement. It needs to be full of joy because we serve an amazing God who's full of joy and passion. That's what it should be like. And I think when I, when I look around the room with all these people in this room, I'm thinking that you know, there's a lot of people come from a lot of different church backgrounds, a lot of different church worship styles. So I could probably talk about any kind of worship in here this morning. I could, I could probably talk about liturgy. And some of you would go, yeah, I do that one. That's where the preacher says something and the, the church responds and so and, and be with you. And, and you stand up and sit down and stand up and sit down and stand up and sit down. I could talk about a cappella worship where there's no musical instruments whatsoever. Somebody just sings and you hope they're in a good key and you sing along with them. I could talk about southern gospel music, and we could just shout and shout and shout and shout and shout. I could talk about high church worship. I could talk about traditional church worship. I could talk about charismatic church worship. We could talk about worship that lasts 15 minutes. We can talk about worship that lasts two hours. And two hours in some churches, two hours of just music and singing and all. And just work. Ours is like an hour of singing and praising and reading and learning and praying. And, and all of this, all the different styles of worship is just proof that there are limitless ways to express our love, and thankfulness, and worship to God. And with so many different ways to worship God, we have to ask ourselves, which one's the best? Which, which one pleases God the most? The answer, the answer is, all of them can please God. But none of them will please God if the heart's not right. None of them. Any, any expression of worship pleases God when the heart is connected to who God is. But no form of worship will please God when our heart's not right. They honor me with their lips. It may look like worship, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. What pleases God is not not the style, not the style of music, 
It's not the culture of the community. It's not the uh, reverence or the rowdiness in a service, but it's the reflection of the condition of one's heart before God. Is the heart right before God? And if we're followers of Jesus, our worship is not to be a hobby. It's not to be a fad that next year I like this kind of worship. Next month I like this kind of worship. I like this kind of church. And this church is pop. It's not to be a label. Well, they have this kind of worship at their church. They have no. It's to be our life. Worship isn't just the songs we sing. Worship is the life we live. In fact, I, I, I want to change things up a little bit today. I know we get accustomed to the way things go. I want to just change things. I'm, I'm going to ask the praise team to come back up here. And don't, don't get all antsy. Oh, we're getting ready to leave early today? No, no, no. I, I know that's what you're thinking. But anyway, uh, it, it just, it, it's kind of out of the ordinary to have them up here while I'm on stage, but it just felt kind of strange to me to be talking about worship today and being the only person on stage when I've got, I've got a whole team of worship leaders that are on stage each week to lead us in worship. And I know, I know from experience that they spend all week practicing, that some of them will spend a couple weeks just to make sure they're practicing. But what I really know is how they prepare their hearts to lead us in worship each week. It's, it's, a, it's a heart thing for them. And I just, I just feel like we need to take some time, or just a little bit of time this morning to prepare our hearts, prepare our hearts to worship, to visualize, to visualize who God is, to visualize what he did for us, to understand that that God, created of all things, came to earth as a child, as a baby, <clears throat> Jesus, and walked this earth, a sinless life, and to take all of our mistakes on him, willingly, not forcefully, but willingly upon himself, to die on the cross in our place, to give his life for us, to be raised back to life by the Spirit of God on the third day so that if we believe that and we accept that with our heart and our mind, which is kind of hard, but our heart is a little easier, we have a relationship with God that makes us a child of God. We sang that a while ago. I am who you say I am, a child of God. And it's, in this journey, we become followers of Jesus, and as followers of Jesus, with our heart made right before God, sometimes we just have to express. We just have to express our love and our praise and our worship to God for who He is and what He did for us. But here's a dilemma. How do we express worship to God? How do we express our worship to God? How do we express worship to God that's going to be pleasing to God? Sometimes we bow in reverence. Sometimes we just, we're so overwhelmed when we visualize what God has done for us through his son. We're just overwhelmed that we can be in the presence of God, that we can't stand in his presence. We can't. We have to bow before him in presence. We have to fall on our knees in an act of submission and worship. And we, this is a choice that we get to make as children of God. We get to choose that so we can choose every day in our life to bow before God. Or one day we all will. Because Philippians chapter 2 says us that at, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in view of what God has done for us, in view of who God is and what he gave for us, sometimes we just bow in reverence. Sometimes we lift our hands in adoration to God. Sometimes we just throw our hands up. And it was, it's, 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 it's so neat because I was remembering earlier in the year we talked about the Hebrew words for worship and yada. Just came to my mind as soon as I read it. Yada. We lift our hands. We reach out to God. We hold our hands up to God. It isn't weird. 
It isn't charismatic. It's biblical. David, David wrote about this in Psalm, Psalm 63. He said, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Sometimes when we worship, sometimes when we worship, we lift our hands. And you know what? You know what this symbolizes? And it's not, I got a question. And it's not, I need to be excused. It symbolizes surrender. Sometimes we're faced with difficult times in our life and we surrender. We give up. Sometimes in the presence of God, we surrender to Him, to His will, not our will. When God, when I'm, not, I'm not doing your, my way anymore, I want to do it your way, so I surrender. Another time we lift our hands, we lift our hands in victory because our team wins and we celebrate. We, we, we lift our hands. And the crazy thing is, getting this, the crazy thing, when we're worshiping God and we lift our hands, both results happen at the same time. When we surrender to God, we experience the victory we have in Jesus. It's the craziest thing that happens when we worship. That's what happens when we worship. This is what it's all, what happens. Here. We, you know, how do we express our worship to God? How do we express worship to God to where he's pleased? We, sometimes we bow in reverence. Sometimes we lift our hands in adoration. Some, sometimes we dance. Sometimes we, we just got to dance in celebration. Uh, sometimes this whole corner back here, I designate my dance corner back there in the back of during the worship. If you look back there, now that we have lights, you can see me back there. I watch myself because I'm usually just, I'm just having a great time back there. Some, sometimes, you know, in life, things like that happen. Uh, David even wrote this in Psalm 149. It says, let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. Timbrel and harp, percussion and strings, drums, piano, guitar. Let, let, let's, you know, praise him like every, every now and then, every now and then, we, do, we just have to dance. And I know some of y'all, oh, I'd never dance. <laughs> but most of us have danced. Most, most of us have, have reached a point where we dance. You dance probably when you bought your new home, when you walked in the door the first time. When you walk to the dealership with the keys to your new car. When you left a rise with a new phone at work. <laughs> or any place with a phone that works. Because there's really no Wi-Fi inside. There's, I don't know what that's all about. But, uh, you probably danced when he proposed to you. You probably danced when she said yes. We dance when our team we celebrate each other's chest bumps and high fives and stuff. We dance. We do, we just, we just, we're overcome by dance because there's goodness. There's this goodness. And when we're overwhelmed by the goodness of God, when we recognize and visualize the goodness of God, we can't contain it. And we dance. Sometimes we bow in reverence, yes. Sometimes we lift our hands. Sometimes we just dance. Sometimes we offer a sacrifice of praise a sacrifice of praise Hebrews chapter 13 says that through Jesus through Jesus through what he did by dying on a cross giving his life for us through what he's done for us therefore let us continually continually that means all the time everywhere we are in all circumstances let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And what this means is that we worship God when we feel him and when we don't. We worship God in the blessings and we worship God in the hurt, in the joy and in the sorrow. Whatever's going on, we worship God. We may be on a mountaintop. We may be in the darkest valley ever we ex we've ever experienced, but we make a choice. We make a choice to worship God. It's not based on our circumstances, but on His character. This is who we worship. This is who we turn. Sometimes we bow. Sometimes we lift our hands. Sometimes we dance. Sometimes we make a sacrifice of praise in the midst of joy or sorrow. But daily, every single day, daily, we lay down our lives as an act of worship. 
We lay down our lives as an act of worship. Worship isn't just something that we do. Worship is who we are because of who He is. It's all connected. The way we live is an act of worship. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the believers in Rome. In Romans chapter 12, this is what he said. The very first verse. Therefore, I urge you, I encourage you, I plead with you, I cheer you on, brothers and sisters, believers in Jesus, followers of Jesus, because of what God, in view of God's mercy, in view of who he is and what he's done, here's what I want you to do. I want you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The way you live, that's to be an act of worship. Live your life as worship to God. Offer your life holy and pleasing to God. This, offering our life, living our life to please God, this is your true and proper worship. And in view of who God is and what he's done, that's our only response. That's all we have. That's all we can do is to worship God with all that we are with our life. It's to go through every day, every day and say, God, today I will worship you with my life, God. Today I will live my life to honor you and please you. I will worship you in the good times and the bad times. I'm going to worship you when I'm healthy. I'm going to worship you when I'm battling cancer. I'm going to worship when things are going my way and when things are going against me, God. When I have plenty, I'll worship you. I'll worship you when I'm in want, God. Uh, please, God, everything about my life, I want to present to you as an act of worship because of who you are and what you've done for me because worship isn't just the songs I sing. Worship is the life I live. This is what worship is. It is born out of a heart that's connected to God. The Pharisees weren't connected. They were just going through the motions. They had hollow worship. But I want to have a worship that's not hollow. I want to have a worship that's born out of his heart because in his heart I realized that Jesus gave his life for me. He died on a cross for me. And God showed his love for me through Jesus. And because of what Jesus did, I have access to God. I can be in his presence at any time, in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's worship. That's how that happens to me. And I'm not going to be there to complain to him. I'm not going to be there to fuss at him. I'm going to be there to worship him because he's my rock. He's my redeemer. He's my rescuer. He's my deliverer, my defender. He's my shield strength and my salvation. Jesus. I gave Jesus for me. The bread of life. The light of the world. The living water. The good shepherd. The way. The truth and the life. Jesus. He's the Lamb of God. The Lion of Judah. The returning King of kings and Lord of lords. See, my God is all-powerful. My God is ever-present. My God is eternal. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And I'll offer him my life as a living sacrifice because of who he is and what he's done for me. Holy and pleasing to God because worship isn't just a song I sing. Worship is the life I live. Jesus has undone my worship. So when we worship, do we ask God, are you, are you undoing something to me? Because for some reason, this song right now is meaning more to me than it ever has. Let's ask Jesus undoing your worship. It's, it, it's no longer hollow now. It's heartfelt. So we're here to worship. Let's pray. God, there's things things in our life that, that challenge us and there's things in our life that encourage us. But this moment, this moment, here in your presence, God, we come before you, we bow before you, we lift our hands before you, we dance before you. Because of the sacrifice you've made for me, God, I will praise you every day. Because of what you've done for me. I want my life to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. 
I want my worship no longer to be hollow. I don't want to go through the motions, God. I don't want to just watch from the sidelines. I don't want to be playing the game. I'm in your presence. In this room, right now, God, I'm in your presence. All of this, all of my life, all of my worship, revolves around you. You're the one worthy of all my praise and all my work, honor, all my glory, all my worship. God, it's all for you. So today, would you please help me visualize, maybe even feel what your son went through for me? And undo my worship. Undo this hollowness, this emptiness, and feel it with the love of Jesus. Today, God, undo you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.